les villes, les, les acteurs du privé, on va prendre notre part. Bon. Très bien. Mais néanmoins, l'accord est fragilisé. Mais deuxièmement, on ne va pas assez vite. Et c'est ça le drame. On ne va pas assez vite. Si on continue sur notre lancée, on est là où on s'est engagé à une augmentation d'en moyenne 1,5 degré, on est à 3, 3 degrés et demi. Enfin, ça n'a rien à voir avec ce à quoi on s'est engagé. Rien. Et donc quand je dis qu'on est en train de perdre la bataille aujourd'hui, je veux que vous preniez conscience que derrière moi, il y a des chefs d'État et de gouvernement. Dans 50, 60 ou 100 ans, il y en a 5, 10, 15 qui ne seront plus là. Tout simplement. Ça veut dire ça, ce qu'on est en train de faire. Et on ne pourra pas dire qu'on ne sait pas. C'est ce qu'on est en train de décider à ne pas changer. On décide juste qu'il y en a plusieurs autour de cette table qui vont disparaître, leur population avec eux. Et donc la question pour les leaders qui sont aujourd'hui présents, c'est de savoir si on veut accompagner ça, parce qu'on ne pourra plus expliquer à qui que ce soit qu'on ne savait pas. Cette situation, elle a mis des décennies et des décennies à advenir. Et normalement, on ne devrait pas bouger. Parce que nous, on est élus pour un temps donné. Et le temps où on est élu, normalement, on ne verra pas les conséquences. La communauté d'affaires, elle ne devrait pas bouger. Parce que le temps de gestion de son entreprise n'est pas du tout celui que je viens d'évoquer de la disparition de ces îles, de ces pays vulnérables. Mais on doit tous bouger, parce qu'on aura tous à rendre compte. Et donc ce sommet, ce One Planet Summit, c'est pour moi le début d'une nouvelle génération. Non pas un sommet où on va négocier une déclaration, mais un sommet d'abord où il y a les gouvernements. Il y a 127 États qui sont représentés. Où il y a les régions, les villes, c'est-à-dire toutes les entités publiques non gouvernementales parce qu'elles sont des acteurs essentiels de ce changement, où il y a les fonds souverains, les assurances, les banques, les philanthropes, c'est-à-dire tout ce qui représente l'argent privé, notre capacité à le mobiliser, à le réguler, et où il y a les entreprises privées, les ONG, la société civile, la jeunesse, les scientifiques, c'est-à-dire tous les acteurs de cette transformation. Parce que ce n'est pas une personne dans un pays qui change les choses. Et donc ce que nous devons faire dans les heures qui viennent, c'est très concrètement à chacune et chacun expliquer les engagements que nous prenons fermement pour changer ce qui est devenu aujourd'hui comme une fatalité, pour choisir la vie et la planète qu'on va avoir. Et pour dire voilà ce que je veux changer concrètement et j'en réponds devant vous. Pour la première fois, beaucoup de chefs d'État et de gouvernement ont accepté de ne pas parler. Et je les en remercie parce que faire le déplacement, venir et ne pas parler, c'est très rare dans nos sommets. Non mais c'est vrai. Mais parce qu'ils sont là, engagés et qu'ils veulent aider tous les acteurs dans leur pays. Mais je le dis avant qu'on commence, tous ceux qui ont une annonce, un engagement fort à prendre, auront le droit à la parole en plus de ce qui est prévu. Mais je le dis... À tous ceux qui ont prévu de parler, acteurs privés, financiers, philanthropes, etc., vous allez vous exprimer pour prendre un engagement. Et à l'issue de cette réunion, nous suivrons cet engagement les uns et les autres. Nous, on a pris le plan climat avec des engagements de fermeture de capacité, des engagements d'ouverture de renouvelables. Tout sera, ça sera suivi, évalué, vérifié, parce que ce que nous entamons aujourd'hui, c'est le temps de l'action parce que l'urgence est devenue permanente. Et le défi de notre génération, c'est d'agir, agir plus vite, et gagner cette bataille contre le temps, cette bataille contre la fatalité, pour mettre en œuvre des actions concrètes qui vont changer nos pays, nos sociétés, nos économies, pour que nos enfants, et peut-être même nous-mêmes, nous puissions choisir notre avenir, choisir notre planète, et pas subir le réchauffement, la disparition de pays vulnérables et une transformation profonde. Alors merci beaucoup pour votre engagement, merci d'être là pour continuer à mettre la pression sur tout le monde et je cède maintenant la parole à mes deux co chairman Merci à vous. Merci.
Merci. J'appelle maintenant le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Antonio Guterres. Antonio Guterres, merci d'être avec nous. Give him the... Merci. Give a warm applause to Antonio Guterres. Dear friends of the planet, all protocol observed. As Emmanuel Macron said, we are planet. not... Merci. J'appelle maintenant le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Antonio Guterres. Antonio Guterres, merci d'être avec nous. Give him the... Merci. Give a warm applause to Antonio Guterres. Dear friends of the planet, all protocol observed. Get us there. Every day in every region, the front pages are dominated by weather related disasters storms, floods, droughts, fires. My recent visit to Barbuda and Dominica was truly heartbreaking and eye opening. Climate change is moving much faster than we are. Atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide are higher than they have been for 800,000 years. Alarmingly, this year, saw the first increase in CO2 emissions in the last three years. And the past five have been the hottest period on record. We are in a war for the very existence of life on our planet as we know it, but we have an important ally, science and technology. First, because what is happening is exactly as science has predicted. Second, Technological progress has already exposed the falsehood that responding to climate change is a threat to the economy. The cost of renewable energy is plummeting. All around the world, cities, regions, states and territories are taking climate action and setting their own ambitious targets. Thousands of private corporations, including major oil and gas companies, are taking their own action. Green business is good business. And we are seeing new industries, new markets, healthier environments, more jobs. And the message is simple. Those who fail to bet on a green economy will be living in a grey future. That means much greater ambition by governments, civil society, the private sector, and the world of finance. Finance could be, should be, and will be the decisive factor, the difference between winning and losing the war. Finance, in its very nature, is forward-looking. And we must make sure that it works not only for profit, but for the future of the people and the planet. Finance is not scarce. Today's global financial system is awash with funds. Tens of trillions of dollars are earning low or even negative interest rates. But the opportunities for productive and profitable low-carbon, climate-resilient investments are vast. Renewables are now cheaper than coal-powered energy in dozens of developed and developing countries creating the basis for sustainable energy for all. And it's also a fact that fossil fuels remain heavily subsidized, meaning we are investing in our own doom. I have heard it said that the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. We don't have to wait to run out of coal and oil to end the age of fossil fuels. We need to invest in the future, not the past. We need policymakers and central banks, stock exchanges, pension funds, rating agencies and all financial actors to align investments with the needs of climate action and sustainable development. Mesdames et messieurs, comme je l'ai dit, les fonds ne manquent pas, c'est la confiance qui fait défaut. Il nous faut y remédier. Cela signifie qu'il faut avant tout veiller à ce que les pays riches honorent leur engagement et apporte 100 milliards de dollars par an jusqu'à 2020 à l'intention des pays en développement. Nous en avons tous la responsabilité. Cela signifie que le Fonds vert pour le climat doit devenir un instrument efficace et souple, notamment pour les pays les plus vulnérables, comme les petits États insulaires et les pays les moins avancés. Ces deux conditions sont indispensables pour que la confiance règne entre pays développés et pays en développement. Et les pays en développement ne sont pas responsables du problème auquel ils ont à faire face, et ce n'est donc que justice que les pays développés leur aident à mener ce combat.
Mais, mais les États n'y parviendront pas à eux seuls. Les capitaux privés sont indispensables. Il nous faut créer la confiance et réduire les risques, utiliser au milieu les ressources disponibles et trouver des modes de financement novateurs comme les obligations vertes dont la viabilité et le succès sont déjà des réalités. Les institutions de financement du développement, y compris le groupe de la Banque mondiale, co-organisateur du sommet d'aujourd'hui, ont un rôle essentiel à jouer à cet égard. En limitant les risques, elles peuvent encourager les investissements dans des projets qui contribuent à la lutte contre les changements climatiques. De leur côté, les gouvernements doivent contribuer à créer un environnement propice. Et les choses bougent déjà. Il existe actuellement plus de 1 200 textes législatifs se rapportant au climat dans plus de 60 pays. La tarification du carbone concerne déjà les activités qui représentent 13 du PIB mondial. Alors que nous cherchons à faire preuve d'une ambition plus grande encore, dans le cadre de l'accord de Paris, j'invite instamment tous les gouvernements et toutes les parties prenantes à aller encore plus loin. Le train du climat n'attend pas. Embarquement immédiat. Il n'y a pas de plan B. Je vous remercie. Merci. Please, World Bank President Jim Yong Kim, please join us now. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a great honor to be able to co-host this meeting with President Macron and, uh, and uh, my good friend, Secretary General Antonio Guterres. And in the spirit that uh, President Macron has brought to, to this event, uh, he's asked us to be very, very practical. We first heard about this event uh, at the G20 leaders meeting. And since that time, the pressure of the last six months of actually putting deals on the table has been enormously helpful. So, we, uh, uh, we're grateful for the very, uh, the, the, the very dynamic and uh, pressure-filled leadership that President Macron has brought. So I'm here uh, just to talk about very specific deals that, that came to the table because of this pressure. Some many of you participated in the climate agora uh, that uh, we had earlier. And during the lunch break, uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to, to give you, everybody a sense of the kinds of deals that were put on the table. The first is the West African Coastal Areas Management Program, or WCA WACA. It targets 17 West African countries with the goal of crowding in $2 billion to tackle coastal erosion, flooding, and climate change adaptation. This is uh, an area that we simply have to move much more aggressively on. There's not a single African head of state uh, who hasn't told me that the boot of climate change is on their necks. They feel it every day. We see in report after report that the developing countries have no doubt that climate change is real and is a, is a real threat to them. But this particular deal, uh, uh, for example, the city of St. Louis, uh, St. Louis in uh, Senegal, um, uh, with an initial $250 million uh, package, uh, it will be one of the first beneficiaries. $250 million, which includes $180 million from IDA, our fund for the poorest countries, $20 million from the Global Environment Facility, and $9 million from the Nordic Development Fund. Uh, it's going to be presented to the World Bank uh, Board early in the new year, and the hope is that much more public and private financing will come to the table for this critically important adaptation project. The second deal, and again, this came to pass because of the pressure that uh, President Macron put on everybody. It's the, an Indonesian geothermal project. Uh, we established what we call a resource risk mitigation facility established by the government of Indonesia with support from the World Bank and, and other partners. Uh, the facility will provide concessional funding and grants to pool and reduce the exposure of developers in early exploration and drilling phases of geothermal projects, which is often uh, the, the bottleneck. With $150 million investment from the government and $325 million in concessional financing from us and others, Indonesian Geothermal is expected to leverage up to $4 billion in private sector funding to develop more than one gigawatt of new thermal capacity. And this is part of Indonesia's target to reach 5.8 gigawatts of geothermal capacity by 2026. A third deal, v thank you, for Indonesia. It was, it was remarkable to see how quickly the Indonesian government moved on this particular uh, uh, effort. A third deal, 
the new City Resilience Program. Mike Bloomberg is here in the audience. We're working with the Global Covenant of Mayors to bring together the largest global alliance of cities committed to tackling climate change. The, the, the CRP, as we call it, will design and structure climate resilient investments and catalyze new sources of capital to finance them. Over the next three years, uh, the CRP will leverage $4.5 billion in World Bank uh, loans to catalyze many billions, we hope, in public and private capital for technical assistance, project co-financing, and credit enhancement. Essentially, the program will act as an investment bank for cities to structure programs that address their vulnerabilities to climate change. The first phase is starting with more than 30 cities with the goal of scaling up to more than 500 cities in the next decade. And the final uh, deal I'll tell you about is one that's very exciting to me. It's called the Energy Efficient Services Limited, or EESL. It's a company that finances residential and public sector energy in, uh, efficiency investments in India. EESL has already deployed more than 275 million LED bulbs, 4.2 million LED tube lights, and 4 million street lights in mun municipalities throughout India. Through an innovative bulk procurement business model, EESL has driven down prices to make climate smart LED bulbs as affordable as conventional bulbs, saving energy costs for customers. By mid-2019, this program would have saved enough, just by mid-2019, saved enough energy to avoid 20 gigawatts of electricity capacity, which would have likely been all coal-fired. Uh, <clears throat> early next year, ESL will use a $220 million World Bank loan combined with an $80 million guarantee facility and leverage an additional $200 million of private commercial finance to deploy thousands of electric cars and charging stations and millions of smart meters throughout the world. 20 gigawatts of coal-fired power taken offline. So these are just some of the deals that we talked about. So let's see India. We all, we all know Prime Minister Modi is moving very, very quickly. We continue to uh, have tremendous demand from African leaders for our scaling solar project, where we come in and we have the entire solution in a single package, everything from the auction to the procurement to the finance. And uh, Zambia recently uh, had record low uh, auction of four and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which has recently been financed through private sector sources. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. And at the World Bank Group, we have continued to evolve uh, over time. Uh, as a global multilateral development institution, the World Bank Group is con continuing to transform itself, ourselves, uh, in this world. Uh, to ensure that we are aligned uh, with our support to, to their countries to meet their Paris goals, today we're announcing that the World Bank Group will no longer finance upstream oil and gas after 2019. <laughs> Now, now just, just as in our coal policy, we have done any coal since 2010, we still leave the possibility that in exceptional circumstances, the poorest countries may need some help, but uh, the, the policy will change and change dramatically. Uh, we are so grateful for all of you for being here. We're so grateful to, to President Macron, to Secretary General Guterres. Uh, but uh, 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 for me, every day, every day, I hear new uh, facts and new insights that scare me even more about climate change. The melting of the permafrost to the possibility of unveiling uh, uh, viruses that the world has not seen for a very long time. There are so many different possibilities. That, that we have to do this work with the greatest sense of urgency, but we also have to do this work with everyone at the table, the private sector, financiers, the multilateral organizations, governments, and get the deals on the table. Uh, President Macron uh, hosted this remarkable day in which we actually put deals on the table. We're going to do it again. We're preparing for COP24. Well, well, there will be even more deals on the table. And I think that could form the foundation for every country to increase their ambition uh, and get to the two degrees Celsius target that we're all hoping for and that we want to leave to our children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à vous trois. Euh, 
Nous tenions également euh, à remercier hein, spécialement euh, Sa Majesté euh, Mohamed VI qui a tenu par sa présence à, à cette séquence d'ouverture, marqué euh, son engagement pour la cause du climat euh, par l'organisation de la COP22, euh, son leadership pour le développement durable du continent, euh, du continent africain, bien sûr, un ambitieux programme marocain d'énergie euh, renouvelable, euh, Sa Majesté Mohamed VI, qui démontre hein, par là même combien la question du climat est universelle et concerne tous les pays du Sud et également euh, du Nord. Et puis, euh, permettez-moi également de souligner combien la, la présence du prince Moulay El Hassan est aussi un symbole fort de l'implication de la jeunesse euh, pour défendre l'avenir de la planète. Merci. Merci. Et je laisse maintenant la parole à Géraldine pour euh, eh bien, la première Merci. séquence de cet après-midi. Merci beaucoup, Raphaël. Merci, messieurs. Alors, as usual, the French president is not making it easy for us, journalists. Thank you very much, Mr. President. He intends to respect his pledges, from what I understand. You asked each and every one of them if they wanted to say something. I say, yes, you can. Make it short. Make it short. Thank you very much. So we're going to kickstart the first sequence of um, the afternoon. It's, it's called Increasing Financing for Adaptation and Resiliation. The president of the World Bank mentioned the uh, project which is called WACA, West Africa Coastal Adaptation. We know that we are fighting the climate change on so many front lines. And it's not just the Arctic, it's not just the Antarctic, it's also the coastlines of Africa. And we will be shown very shortly, very briefly, a, a little video um, about this program, which is dedicated to the adaptation of the West African coast in 17 countries in Africa. This program aims to improve adaptations and resilience to all these coastlines from the climate impacts. Can we get the video, please? il y avait une belle plage. Bonnez pas les cocotiers. Bel et bien sabronné aussi. Il y avait un aspect bien touristique. Les beaux jours sont passés. Ce que vous voyez, c'est Mopu. C'était au milieu de la maison. Alors, la mère a pris une partie de la maison et entame le reste. Bientôt, il va déraciner le fruit et puis le, le fait tomber. Il va attaquer la maison. All along West Africa's coast, rising seas, heavy flooding and erosion are destroying dozens of villages, displacing thousands of families and taking away people's homes and jobs. A third of West Africa's people live in coastal areas and their lives are increasingly threatened by the impact of climate change. In fact, about 10 meters of coastline is lost every year. Je n'ai plus de terrain, je n'ai rien. On vivait de la pêche. L'érosion a fait qu'il y a des roches maintenant dans la mer. C'est pas comme la pêche qu'on faisait avant. Nearly half of West Africa's GDP comes from coastal activities. Saving the coastline is crucial for the region's economy and its people. The World Bank and partners created WACA, the West Africa Coastal Areas Management Program, to respond to this crisis. The financing needs are immense. While funds have already been raised, a new investment platform aims to crowd in an additional $2 billion. Waka's actions will transform lives, bring back jobs, and build the resilience of coastal communities. Thank you very much. With me for this panel, I'd like to call Mr. Guterres back, please. Thank you very much. I would like to call the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Monsieur Chastanet. Can you please join us? Where is he? Um, Sir Richard Bronson from the floor. Sir, it's such an honor to have you here. Son Altesse Serenissime, le Prince Albert II. Votre Altesse Sérénissime. Merci. Euh, Son Excellence Franck euh, Bani Marama, président de la COP23, Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji. Je vous en prie, oui.
And last but not least, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Mauritius, Pravin Kumar Jugnot, if they could join me. Am I missing someone? So with the video that we just saw, I mean, this is dramatic, and we're seeing the effect, and all of you are tre tremendously involved in that. Before we kickstart this, I would like actually to bring someone extremely special, someone from the floor. His name is Timothy. He's from the Fiji Islands, and he has a question to you all. Timothy. Yeah. Round of applause. This is the new generation. Go ahead, Timothy. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour and Bolivinaka to you all. My name is Timothy Naul Sala. I am 12 years old and I am from Fiji. Fiji is one of the vulnerable countries affected by climate change. I have a quest question to post it to you. Are you ready to face life without Earth? Have you contemplated what will happen if you ignore this reality, this nightmare? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Sec Mr. Sec Mr. Sec Mr. Sec Mr. Sec Secretary General, can you tell us what you can do to help children like me and children all over the world who are and will be the victims of climate change? Gentlemen, who wants to answer Timothy first? Mr. Secretary General. I think that we all agree that it is better to prevent crises than to manage them. No, prevention in relation to climate change is, first of all, stop this crazy race uh, into uh, warming the planet, stopping this crazy race of emissions. But we know that even today, countries uh, like Fiji, small islands in the Caribbean or the Pacific are already the victims of climate change. They have not contributed to it, but they are paying the price. And so again, we need another form of prevention, which is to build resilience in those communities and to mobilize the international community to support those countries to build resilience. Now, uh, uh, this is not always easy. Uh, I was recently uh, in Barbuda and Dominica after the terrible uh, devastation of these two islands. And what was very interesting is that the Prime Ministers of Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica did not ask for money just for humanitarian response. They asked for money to rebuild a resilient Barbuda and to rebuild a resilient Dominica. Which means we need to mobilize resources of the international community to support the governments and the communities of these states, island states in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, to build resilience for their societies. And uh, uh, that, of course, uh, uh, is extremely important, and that requires a meaningful amount of funding. Now, some of these countries are middle-income countries. They have not been receiving uh, different forms of concessional assistance, but they are very vulnerable to external shocks. So we need to have innovative financing to allow for these countries to benefit from these forms of finance. Some of these countries have huge debts. One of the things that we could foresee is the possibility to transform debt payments into investments in resilience, forgiving debt but forcing the countries to invest in resilience. So there is a lot of innovative ideas that the UN needs to put on the table that entities like the World Bank can promote and can push in order to mobilize the international community to support these countries, to help their societies build the resilience in the way they construct, in their infrastructure, in the way agriculture uh, works, in the protection of their coasts. Uh, this requires a massive support, and we have the obligation to mobilize the international community to provide it. Thank you so much. Prime Minister, you're there. Um, there's two perspectives. There's the word mitigation, 
and I just want to take the opportunity to thank everybody here um, for the pressure that are putting on the world to change it habit, its habits because mitigation is important to reduce the carbon emissions. The second word is adaptation. And uh, the UN General Secretary has touched on some of the key issues, which is how do we allow countries to help themselves? You have a set of countries, which Timothy comes from, called SIDS, Small Island Developing States, which have been put in the impossible position in which even if we were to change our habits, we cannot change our future because the hurricane season is coming next year. There's, there's no doubt about that. So Timothy, when he gave his speech in Bonn, to me reminded all of us of what this is about, that we start too often at the macro level and we're not thinking small. Thinking small is thinking of Timothy, Timothy's family. So if what we're recommending cannot resolve the problem at the family level, then we're not going to resolve the problem at the macro level. So it's in addition to the reclassification of the OECDs, we have a problem in that the world keeps pledging money towards the SIDS. That money has not come. And therefore, every year that we wait for the money to arrive, we remain vulnerable. The third one is that even when we get the money, the bureaucracy that's created to draw down the funds means sometimes we wait four and five years to see a project implemented. And the last one is exactly what Mr. Gutierrez made mention of. If we already have debt and we have to now build this resilience and we have to then borrow money to build that resilience, then we are now going to become financially unviable, undermining our own way forward. What we keep saying to the world and we've been saying for the last four months, particularly after the hurricanes, and coming back to Timothy's point, how do we help Timothy's family? A pen. A pen to change the, the classification at the OECD to allow ring fence the SIDS and allow them to access concessional funds. A pen to create the incentives to put a fund together, both from the private sector and for the public sector, to allow us to build resilience a pen to change the protocols on how we're going to draw down on funds, and finally, a pen on how we're going to classify that debt. That, this is what the solution to Timothy's problem is, a pen. And I'm asking everybody to please take out your pen and help us. Thank you, Prime Minister. You said money hasn't come, and if we get it sometimes, there are so such an ordeal from the administration to get it. But perhaps the solution is private money. Right, Sir Richard. Sir Richard, you weathered an extreme hurricane recently. I couldn't you came out. You came out pretty fine. <laughs> it, was, it was something. So the, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so we, I've, I've been through four hurricanes in my life, um, and they're getting stronger. Um, and the reason they're getting stronger is because the sea is getting warmer. Um, and. Uh, and the last hurricane um, that uh, hit us was over 200 miles an hour. So uh, the, the highest a category goes is five. This was a category seven. Um, and uh, and it, it, you know, we, it, we, we, we bunkered down. Um, we came out after five hours. And it was like a nuclear bomb had uh, hit, hit the Caribbean. I mean, there were, there were no trees left. Uh, there was almost nothing left. And, um, and the Caribbean, uh, the people are very resilient. They're wonderful people. Um, they'll pick themselves up uh, and they will do their absolute best to, to rebuild. Um, but it sets them back. You know, there will be no tourists for a year. Uh, the, the businesses all leave. I mean, the, you know, for the first month after the hurricane, uh, everybody was trying to find a way of getting out of the Caribbean. And no, nobody was coming to the Caribbean. Um, and I think that you know, what he was saying about uh, reclassification is critical. Um, the international community uh, needs to accept that the, the small island countries, if we're going to continue to have small island countries, uh, they, they, they need to be reclassified. They, uh, they need to uh, be able to access money to be able to help them get back on their feet. Uh, they need to be able to access um, help to get them back on their feet. To be, they be, need to be able to rebuild their houses in a resilient way 
so that when the next hurricane happens, uh, it's not going to set them back, you know, a year or two years. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we, we have together with, with all the Caribbean, most of the Caribbean countries set up a, um, you know, a uh, strategic uh, group of people to try to, uh, uh, to tackle these issues, to try to get the rules changed so that the Caribbean, ca you know, can get back on its feet. And how do you do that? To get them back on the feet. You need money, obviously. How do we do it? We need, um, money. We, we, you need we, public we, money, you need private money, you need partnership. Public money, private money, partnerships. Um, well, the World Bank have been incredibly supportive. They, they jumped in very quickly. The International Development Bank, they've jumped in very quickly. Um, uh, and, and, and other organizations like that have, 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 moved, have moved very quickly. Um, but they've got their hands tied to an extent, and and um, and what we what we hope to be able to do over the next month or two is try to get the international community, most of whom are in this room, who can actually make make that uh, that change with their pen, uh, to change the categorization so that uh, instead of um, the, the the countries having to wait five years for the money, instead of them being lumbered with very high interest rates when. Uh, money is actually, you know, very cheap out there at the moment. Uh, that, that they can be given given money quickly and at, lo at low interest rates, so they can get back on their feet. Thank you so much. Votre Altesse Sérénissime, l'océan, c'est un de vos combats. Uh, il joue un rôle plus qu'important dans l'équilibre de nos écosystèmes. Uh, et quels sont, d'après vous, quand on voit la vidéo, quelles sont, d'après vous, les prochaines étapes? pour protéger les océans et pour protéger aussi euh, les côtes. Il y, a plusieurs, euh, il, y a, il y a plusieurs façons de procéder. Bon, J'aurais pu répondre en anglais aussi, mais il n'y a pas de problème. Mais il faut, il faut que le français ait une part dans cette conversation. Donc, euh, écoutez, je crois qu'il y, y a des très bons moyens euh, qui sont les aires marines protégées. Euh, parce que non seulement, elles, quand on protège euh, suffisamment de... de de lieux dans le monde et on est encore loin des euh, euh, objectifs qui ont été fixés à Haïti en 2010 qui prévoyaient pour euh, 10 euh, des, euh, des, des océans enfin des, des mers et des océans du monde euh, en air marine protégée euh, alors qu'on en est qu'à peine à peine 3 euh, avant 2020 donc euh, je pense que c'est pas peu de dire qu'on qu qu n'y arrivera pas mais il faut faire tout ce qui est en notre pouvoir pour euh, qu'il y ait le plus possible d'aires marines protégées parce qu'on euh, s'aperçoit euh, tous les jours et avec, il y a de nombreuses études qui ont, qui ont, qui ont été faites pour, pour euh, mo démontrer le, le bienfait des aires marines protégées, non seulement pour protéger des, des écosystèmes, pour protéger des espèces, pour euh, aussi euh, favoriser les... les euh, les populations locales qui, qui vivent aux abords de, de ces aires marines protégées et qui arrivent, si on euh, les forme de, de façon la, plus, la meilleure possible, que la pêche autour de ces aires marines protégées eh bien, euh, est, est, est encore plus abondante que, que si on ne faisait rien. Et donc, euh, et vous savez que cela peut créer aussi beaucoup d'emplois euh, et beaucoup de... de, de euh, et puis euh, une préservation et une meilleure gestion de tout ce que la mer peut nous rapporter. Et puis dans les écosystèmes côtiers, bien sûr, il euh, y, y a des aires marines protégées qui sont, euh, euh, qui, qui sont le long des côtes, mais il faut aussi protéger la, la haute mer. Et là, c'est un, un autre débat et c'est un, un débat qui est euh, encore euh, au sein des Nations Unies. Et il y a euh, toute un, euh, une série de, de, de mesures qui, ont, qui, ont déjà été, qui sont euh, en train d'être envisagées. Euh, mais euh, la haute mer, c'est aussi un autre enjeu pour une meilleure protection alors là, de, de toutes les ressources que, et de et toutes les espèces que l'on peut trouver en haute mer. Um, I'm fortunate to be joined by the Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji. We had Timothy earlier, Mr. President, who um, sort of, you know, cast a light, a dire light on uh, his family's situation. Uh, you're also the President of the COP23. It was the first COP for the Pacific um, uh, held in Bonn last November. Um, so what progress has been done at COP23 on the question on financing? 
Can we also talk about the place that was given to adaptation, resilience? Thank you. Good afternoon, Your, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, I spoke at the opening session this morning of the urgent need to accelerate the deployment of uh, both public and private uh, capital in our effort to address climate change. And this afternoon, I welcome the opportunity to focus on the question of how we can scale finance for adaptation and resilience. The leaders on this panel are fully aware of the need to make substantial investments in our infrastructure to protect against the danger of climate change. Fiji stressed in our national address at COP23 that despite the commitments on climate finance that have been made, only a small portion of this finance finds its way into supporting climate adaptation or resilience. The data on this is clear. For many donors, this is simply regarded as development assistance. And for private sector investors, the absence of an immediate and apparent economic return on their investment means that funding climate adaptation or resilience efforts are really rarely pursued. This raises two important points. First, for developing and vulnerable countries, there is a false distinction between building climate resilience and preparing to adapt to climate change on one hand and investing in more traditional infrastructure for economic development on the other. All investments should be evaluated in the light of the new norm of climate disruption. This requires careful planning, design and policies to strengthen climate proof the infrastructure our citizens depend on for their livelihoods. We should therefore not create artificial distinctions between climate change adaptation and mitigation on one hand and economic development on the other. For many vulnerable developing nations, your excellencies, these are one and the same. Second, we need climate adaptation or resilience investments to be properly valued in such a way that investors can gain a competitive time relevant return. Where global businesses recognize the value in future proofing their supply chains, we can see the business case for such investment. And that is a good start. But greater thinking needs to go into how to define and then monetize the investment value for undertaking longer term infrastructure investments that reduce the future risk of loss from climate change. The value for doing so is real, but the financial system has yet not defined that value for investors. In Fiji's case, we know only too well how vulnerable we are after the biggest cyclone ever to make landfall in the southern hemisphere ripped through our nation last year, killing 44 of our citizens and causing losses equal to one third of our GDP. We're building back, we're building slowly, but we're building back better. In the face of this vulnerability, we are attempting to lead by example. At COP23, we launched, with the support of the Asian Development Bank and Luxembourg, the Pacific Climate Finance and Insurance Incubator to deliver real investments in the fight against climate change. And on the 1st of November this year, we launched our sovereign green bond, becoming the first ever emerging economy to do so, and only the third in the world after Poland and, of course, France. These proceeds from these bonds will be invested in mitigation and adaptation, adaptation projects. We are focused on rebuilding and strengthening our infrastructure in a resilient, uh, climate resilient way with blended finance from institutions like the Green Climate Fund and multilateral development banks to supplement the Fijian government's own capital investment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Mr. Jugnot, Prime Minister of the Republic of Mauritius. I mean, Mauritius is as vulnerable as all these uh, small islands. I mean, what do you do? What do you see? What do you want? What do you expect here? What can you say to Timothy as well? Well, we, I must say we are in the same situation as Fiji and so many small developing island states. We face the same challenges. I believe we are the uh, least ones who contribute to uh, the greenhouse uh, gas emission, and yet we are the major victims, and we are the most vulnerable ones. In terms of economic development, we have no uh, natural resources, except that we've been investing a lot in our human resources, and we have uh, uh, 
made a lot of effort uh, to div diversify the economy. We have uh, now become an upper middle income uh, economy. But unfortunately, I must say, when we used to benefit before from international funding, uh, now we are told that uh, we are not eligible anymore. So once again, I must say we are victim our own, of our own success. Uh, but as you know, uh, the tourism sector, just to give an example, is a very important sector. It contributes to about 7% of the GDP of uh, Mauritius. Uh, and uh, we face the same challenges as you have seen in the video with regard to uh, Western Africa. So uh, I hope that uh, now, uh, and that is the hope that we have with this uh, uh, conference, uh, the eligibility to have access to, to finance because our, uh, our national determined contribution is estimated at 5.5 billion US dollars. So I would perfectly agree with what has been said before by Secretary General that we must uh, see to it one fundamental issue for small island developing states. We must see to it how, first of all, we have access to finance, and secondly, uh, how we uh, make it flexible so that we are uh, able to have this access as early as possible in order to face uh, those threats. That, that is uh, my, my stand, and I hope that this message uh, on behalf of small island developing states uh, will be received. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Let me turn to the audience here, and I'm looking actually for Moïse Jovenel, who's the President of the Republic of Haiti. I'm sorry, sir, I don't see you. Forgive me. There you are. There you are. Hi. Um, Monsieur le Président, Haïti aussi a été au cœur de toutes ces saisons uh, d'ouragan. Um, on me dit qu'il faut que je vous parle en français, but I can do this in English if you'd rather. There you go. So I, I, Haiti was definitely at the heart of all these um, hurricane season. It was really, really bad. Your country didn't need that, and nevertheless, it will have to face that. Um, what is for you the situation of Haiti regarding all these risks uh, related to climate change? And, and I know that you're really keen on talking about forests and woods as they're part of your climate action. Peace, sir. Merci. Je dois dire qu'Haïti a connu pendant les dix dernières années, bon, pour ne pas dire les treize dernières années, de 2004 à 2017, des catastrophes naturelles à répétition. Mais l'ouragan Mathieu, l'année dernière, nous a laissé plus de 30% de dégâts, quand je parle de 30% de dégâts au niveau de notre PIB. Cela veut dire que Haïti a connu des, des dégâts qui dépassent les 2,5 milliards. Et, et cette année, je, je veux parler de 2017, parce que nous avons une saison cyclonique très longue entre le 1er juin et le 30 novembre. L'ouagan Irma nous a laissé des, des inondations aussi sur le nord. Je dois vous dire qu'Haïti est dans une zone extrêmement fragile et nous faisons partie des pays insulaires Je veux parler des îles de la Caraïbe. C'est important aujourd'hui de réfléchir, je veux parler des pays de la Caraïbe, de ne pas réfléchir en un seul pays. Il faut voir les pays qui se trouvent dans la Caraïbe parce que nous avons un problème extrêmement grave au niveau des assurances. Je prends l'exemple de 2016. Nous avons eu des dégâts évalué à 2,7 milliards de dollars et la couverture d'assurance que nous avons nous a donné 23 millions de dollars. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, il faut réfléchir premièrement à une couverture d'assurance pour la Caraïbe. 
Là, on parle de, de One Planet. Je pense qu'il faut parler de One Caribbean. Parce que les pays de la Caraïbe, nous sommes tous menacés par, par ces catastrophes. Et deuxième chose, c'est la bureaucratie. J'ai entendu beaucoup de choses là pour, pour l'Afrique. J'ai entendu beaucoup de choses aussi pour d'autres pays. Mais je dois vous dire, comme mon frère de, de, de Sainte-Lucie, le problème de la bureaucratie est un problème extrêmement grave. Parce que Haïti, pays insulaire, les ouragans ne vont pas nous attendre. Par exemple, nous sommes en décembre 2000, 2017. Ça peut arriver qu'aujourd'hui, il y a en fait euh, une décision, je, je dirais politico-économique, pour ces, pour ces pays. Et puis, deux ans après, nous attendons encore cette aide. Premièrement, il faut que l'aide soit donnée au gouvernement. C'est une très, très, ce sera une très bonne chose parce que aujourd'hui, les, les gouvernements, je prends l'exemple d'Haïti, nous savons exactement ce que nous avons comme problème et les solutions, nous sommes en train de réfléchir sur, sur des solutions alternatives. Je prends l'exemple de l'énergie. Nous sommes en train de travailler pour que l'énergie renouvelable, la matrice énergétique d'Haïti soit une matrice verte. Je veux parler de, de l'énergie éolienne, de l'énergie solaire, de l'hydroélectrique et de la biomasse. Deuxièmement, parlons maintenant de l'environnement. Nous sommes en train de mettre sur pied, d'ailleurs nous avons inauguré le, le mois dernier notre premier centre Germoplace. Nous avons des, des pépinières de 4,5 millions de plantules sur chaque département. Nous avons 10 régions à travers le pays. À la fin de 2018, nous allons avoir 10 pépinières de 4 500 000 plantules chacune. Et au niveau de l'école, dans le curriculum de l'école, il sera une obligation pour les élèves, parce que nous avons 4 400 000 élèves qui vont à l'école chaque année en Haïti. Chaque élève sera bien obligé de faire la mise en terre d'une quantité de plantules. Ce sera obligatoire, ce sera en fait dans, la, dans, la, dans, dans le bulletin de, de l'élève. Justement pour vous dire qu'aujourd'hui nous sommes en train de prendre des initiatives, c'est une très bonne chose de voir, de regarder le gouvernement et de travailler un petit peu plus vite parce que les ouragans ne vont pas nous attendre. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Let me now turn to the floor, and we're very fortunate to have you with us, Sean Penn, the actor, the director, and he's extremely involved in Haiti. He's helping out a lot, and Sean, I'd like you, please, to take the floor and tell us exactly what you're doing and why it needs to be done. Please. President, <laughs> President Macron, President Moïse, Heads of state, representatives in the international organizations, youth leaders, ladies and gentlemen. I first arrived in Haiti in the wake of the devastating earthquake that struck the country in January 2010. Since then, I've had the honor and the privilege to witness the Haitian people rise from the rubble, steadily rebuild their country in the wake of this unprecedented disaster. Led by the government of Haiti, They overcame long odds and many challenges in order to dig themselves out, dust themselves off, and to begin to rebuild and move toward the brighter future that they so deserve. But today, Haiti does face arguably even greater challenges, a looming existential threat which they, to which they bear no responsibility. The fight to survive and thrive under the increasingly harsh and unpredictable conditions of a, of a warming planet. As one of the countries least responsible for climate change, Haiti is one of the most vulnerable to, to its effects. Farmers' crops are suffering from new and unfamiliar diseases. Seasonal rains are less certain, and the region's frequent storms <coughs> are more savage. Importantly, just like after the earthquake, 
Haiti does not need our handouts or our pity. Under President Moise's leadership and his caravan of change, Haiti has the vision, the technical experts, most importantly, the spirit of its remarkable people needed to overcome even this trial. But they do need our support to be able to realize these plans. As those responsible for climate change, the international community needs to support Haitian-led climate adaptation efforts with more financial and technical resources to respond to the urgent needs on the ground. Haiti can win this fight as it has overcome every other challenge ever thrown at it, but it needs friends and allies to do so. That's why my organization, JPHRO, along with the French government, the World Bank, and the Parker Foundation, and a growing coalition of national and international actors are working to support the government of Haiti's vision for a greener, more prosperous, and more climate resilient Haiti. I call on all of those gathered in this room to stand with Haiti and to help realize its future. I passionately believe that working with and through the government of Haiti, Haiti can become an example of turning the challenges of climate adaptation into an opportunity for sustainable, sustainable development, providing the world with an example of how the threat of climate change can and must be overcome. Thank you. Nous avons aussi avec nous le maire de Saint-Louis, au Sénégal, qui est aussi le ministre de l'énergie du pays, M. Mansour Faye. Donc, M. Monsieur, monsieur Faye, la ville de Saint-Louis, au Sénégal, va rejoindre le projet Waka, si je ne me trompe pas. Euh, il faut répondre à une urgence, c'est l'érosion. Vous avez déjà dû évacuer plusieurs familles, me semble-t-il. Donc, moi, je vais vous demander, comment est-ce qu'on se prépare à être plus résilient Est-ce qu'on demande Est-ce qu'on fait est-ce qu'on n'attend pas Comment est-ce que vous faites, vous Merci beaucoup. Je précise, je suis le ministre de l'hydraulique et de l'assainissement, maire de Saint-Louis, mais qui souhaiterait poser euh, ma question surtout au président Macron. Ah. Hein? Je vais l'écrire. Je vais reprendre en voilà. Donc, pour rappel, euh, en 1926, à Saint-Louis, donc, alors colonie française, le gouverneur de l'époque, Jules Gaston Henri IV, instruisit l'érection d'un mur de protection pour euh, protéger Saint-Louis contre les régions côtières. Aujourd'hui, cette digue est en train de s'effondrer euh, à une vitesse grand V, livrant Saint-Louis à la merci donc, de la furie des vagues, dont la fréquence s'accentue de plus en plus avec son lot de conséquences. Destruction des habitations, perte de territoire, perte donc d'activité économique. Alors, Monsieur le Président, au mois de février prochain, vous allez effectuer un, un voyage, une visite au Sénégal avec probablement une étape à Saint-Louis. Euh, en termes d'engagement, déjà la Banque mondiale à travers le WACA est en marche vers l'action. Et je souhaiterais euh, savoir, connaître en tout cas du président Macron, le message à transmettre à ces populations qui récitent par cœur les termes adaptation climatique, atténuation climatique et résiliation, mais qui assistent impuissamment en tout cas à la, à la, à la destruction, assistent la mer en train d'avaler leur espace économique, d'avaler en tout cas leur espace de vie. Et moi, je voudrais savoir en réalité... Qu'est-ce qui est prévu dans l'immédiat hein, pour, en tout cas, mettre un frein ou un terme donc, à l'érosion côtière C'est la question que je voudrais adresser et je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. So, for those who didn't get it, uh, my York son was asking, what is planned right now? And I'm turning to uh, Secretary General Guterres as a way to sum this. Africa. Caribbeans, elsewhere, everywhere. A lot of countries are showing resilience, they're showing goodwill, they're showing dignity in the face of the terrible ordeals from climate change. What can we tell them? 
What's coming right now? Well, the first thing is to make sure that commitments are respected. There is a commitment of $100 billion uh, from the developed world, uh, supporting the developing world from 2020. We must make sure that commitment is maintained. Second, many people have said that uh, I believe they were referring to the green fans. Things are slow, things are complex, not always attending small projects. In the, the, there is clearly a scope for improvement and reform. Then uh, uh, it is clear that uh, the World Bank has shown the way. With a small grant, you can transform a big commercial loan into a soft loan. They have done it for Lebanon and Jordan because of the refugees, mm -hmm. uh, because of an external impact on middle-income countries. We have a number of middle-income countries with external shocks. So again, they should be able to deserve the same kind of treatment. Then, uh, uh, one other aspect which is obvious, guarantees can facilitate private investment, and they are relatively cheap to give. Uh, insurance mechanisms with small subsidies can work and can produce a lot of results. Remittances, all these countries, or many of these countries have remittances. Some of them pay huge fees. These should be also removed. There is a lot of things we can do, and the role of the UN is obviously to be in permanent advocacy and putting always on the table the things that the different international organizations need to do and countries need to do in the boards of those organizations to allow leaders like Jim Kim to be able to move forward with the many of his ideas and projects and at the same time to support governments that are doing everything and communities that are doing everything to make sure that they can resist to the consequences of actions that are done by others. It was a fantastic first part of this session and we have to thank our wonderful panelists. I want to thank you, all of you. It was you know, very insightful. I want to thank the President of Haiti, Sir Richard, Prime Minister, Votre Altesse Serenissime, Prime Minister, Monsieur le Président, Sean, thank you so much, Monsieur le Maire, every one of you. Thank you. So, we're running super late, so let me quickly move to the second part. Um, we're talking about land degradation, and there's a fund that has been put together, uh, a new investment model for the planet. You will see a short video, less than two minutes, that is showing you what this neutrality fund for land degradation is doing. Um, public funding to mobilize private funding to finance climate and development objectives. And it has been it's launched by the United Nations Convention and it's to fight desertification, desertification and developed by Mirova. Three million have been mobilized, three million almost, for its first closing. Can we please have the video? Êtes-vous déterminé à réduire les impacts du changement climatique Alors la Terre doit faire partie de l'équation. Si nous parvenons à restaurer chaque année 12 millions d'hectares de terre sur les 2 milliards qui sont actuellement dégradés, nous pourrons d'ici 2030 séquestrer 39 milliards de tonnes de dioxyde de carbone dans le sol, protéger 52 millions d'hectares de forêt et jouer un rôle majeur dans l'adaptation au changement climatique. Mais aussi Réduire les conflits liés aux ressources naturelles et l'immigration forcée. Créer des millions d'emplois verts. Améliorer la sécurité alimentaire. Comment y parvenir Le fonds LDN. Initiative lancée par la Convention des Nations Unies sur la lutte contre la désertification. Le fonds LDN est une innovation financière conduite par un gestionnaire de fonds privés, Mirova, et une coalition de porteurs de projets et d'investisseurs. Partant de l'idée que même les terres dégradées sont une opportunité économique, le fonds LDN financera des projets de réhabilitation de terres qui ont des impacts mesurables et durables sur le terrain. Pour rendre ce modèle économique viable, des bailleurs publics se sont engagés à sécuriser le risque pris par les investisseurs privés. Avec votre soutien, le fonds LDN marquera un nouveau tournant pour la finance climat et contribuera aux 3,6 milliards de dollars qui sont nécessaires chaque année pour restaurer les terres. Investir dans la restauration des terres, c'est investir dans l'avenir des populations. Ensemble, 
nous pouvons façonner un futur meilleur et plus sûr. Thank you. So this second part is called cross-cutting adaptation needs. We've mentioned it, but actually there's no way around. It's also again about financing. Money is key. For me, um, it's been an interesting uh, session so far. I would like to ask you again, Antonio Guterres, please, sir, to come back. I would like to ask Her Excellency Sheikh Asina, Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, to join us. Madame. Such an honor. Yes, come over here, join us. Um, of course, His Excellency Ali Bongo, the uh, President of the Republic of Gabon. Lars Rasmussen, Prime Minister of Denmark, can you please join us? Idris Deby, President of Chad. Thank you. And last but not least, Christian Kern, who's the Federal Chancellor of Austria. Mein Herr. Willkommen. Entschuldigung, vielleicht hier. I'm sorry, sir. Could you, could you join me? Vielleicht hier. Doch besser. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so let's move on. We've seen this little. Um, segment about uh, the fund. We're talking here about financing to face climate impacts. This was also the topic of a previous session earlier this morning. There's no way around, as I've been saying. Money is key. So what kind of money are we talking about? And why do we still talk about money, Mr. Guterres? Is it still well, missing? According to the UN in, uh, Environment Programme, The needs for adaptation in 2030 will be around $300 billion per year. In 2050, $500 billion per year. And we are talking about adaptation in different fronts. First, adaptation in relation to natural disasters, but also to the slow onset, like, for instance, droughts, and to situations that can become dramatic. We are Bangladesh here on... The prime, the prime Minister on my right-hand side, the coastal right area side. of Bangladesh with the rising level of oceans, the coastal area of Bangladesh with the rising level of oceans could witness uh, an evolution that might put into question the lives of more than 20 million people. So we are talking of huge changes that we need to be able to prevent and in some situations, unfortunately, we'll only need to be able to react. And this requires an enormous amount of funding. And that is why it is so important, I'm not going to repeat, that all the mechanisms that we have described are put in place and new innovative forms of funding are found. In the Sahel, for instance, we have now a French initiative, a very important French initiative, in which asking people that go to, us, uh, to uh, one of these ATM machines if they are ready to contribute to with a small amount, uh, these will be able to... Uh, through a fund that will be managed by the UN uh, operational uh, sector uh, to fund reconversion of agriculture in the Sahel. A very new initiative born here in France that we are going to support. But we need all things that I mentioned in the last session. We need everything. We need to mobilize massively the international community because unfortunately, as things are going, adaptation will have an enormous cost And if we don't pay this cost, that means terrible suffering for millions and millions of people. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Prime Minister, your, your country is the member of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, and I hear vulnerable. I mean, it must be an ordeal. What does it take to protect Bangladesh from, 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 from the impacts of climate warning? How much? What? How big? Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Well, I recall the launching of the 
Global Pact for the Environment at the event in September this year. I applaud Mr. Bartholomew's leadership on climate change. Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries to the impact of climate change, although we are not responsible for this madness. But we are worst sufferer. With our limited resources, we are addressing the consequences of climate change by resilience and adaptation. Despite being a developing country, we spend over 1% of our GDP in combating climate change. We are making our agriculture climate resilient. As a member of the uh, high-level panel on water, I am committed to prioritize the water sustain sustainability issues. Bangladesh has been facing challenges due to the influx of the over the one million forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals. On humanitarian ground, we have given shelter to these distressed Rohingyas in 4,400 acres of our forest land in Kaksas Bazar. The protected displacement crisis has heavily affected our forest and environment in that area. We have already undertaken massive projects for plantation program, which is very, very important. I believe the flagship project of an amount of 50.76 million US dollars is underway for the conservation of Sundarbans, the largest mangrove forest in the world. In the coastal region, we have started building green belt for protecting people from cyclone and tidal surges, coastal erosion, and salinity intrusion. Besides that, we are building cyclone shelter for our people. When the cyclone comes, we just bring all the people so that they can live there and uh, we can save our people's lives. Mr. President, today I like to announce that my government will initiate necessary forestation programs for increasing 2% trees coverage in Bangladesh from the existing 22% to 24% within the next five years. Since nine, uh, 1984, our party, our political party, Bangladesh Awamili, we have started plantation trees. I call upon all my party workers and leaders that every year, each and every people, and also now I call upon our people to at least they should plant three trees every yeah, or more if they can do it. So since 84, we have been uh, planting trees in our country that also assist our people. They can earn some money also, but that also protect our environment. And social frustration, that also. We in actually encourage our women and also our people, if they can plant trees, from the earning, 70% will be there. They will get the 70% money from that plantation. So that way, we are encouraging our people to plant more trees that can help them. And also their houses and uh, habitation, we are building, in the, especially in the coastal area, so that that can save them from the cyclone or tidal surge. That way, we have taken many steps to save our people. I call for bringing climate justice and historical responsibility to the forefront. We can secure the world only through shared responsibility. I strongly believe our collective ambition and commitments for resilience and adaptation would contribute in peace, stability, prosperity, across the society. Not, we just don't want 
to hear the commitment we want that everybody those who especially the developed country the commitment they made they should fulfill it thank you thank you very much your excellency sir can we talk about forest can we talk about wood can we talk about desertification can we talk about all the you want me to do this in french on peut parler de désertification, on peut parler de forêt, ça devient très important. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui doit être fait et quel argent doit être mobilisé pour des pays, euh, un pays aussi important que le vôtre euh, Est-ce que vous avez ce que vous voulez Est-ce que vous en voulez plus Et comment est-ce que vous pouvez aussi vous contribuer Je vous en prie. Je voudrais d'abord commencer par euh, remercier mon ami euh, président Emmanuel Macron pour nous avoir conviés à cette réunion importante. Euh, nous, sommes, nous fêtons le deuxième anniversaire de l'accord de Paris, déjà deux ans. Et je voudrais dire à ce sujet que l'Afrique s'est mobilisée, l'Afrique s'est battue. L'Afrique est le continent qui euh, contribue le moins euh, aux émissions et pourtant l'Afrique n'a pas hésité à répondre à l'appel. Nous nous sommes mobilisés lorsqu'il a fallu euh, nous retrouver à Paris pour signer cet accord. Et aujourd'hui, nous nous mobilisons encore. Mais je voudrais faire une remarque générale qui, euh, simplement, faire remarquer un point. Nous sommes comme dans une, une classe, classe d'école, et nous sommes de mauvais élèves, mais nous sommes contents et fiers d'être de mauvais élèves. <rire> Tous les ans, on se retrouve pour constater à quel point nous sommes de mauvais élèves, que nous sommes en train de perdre une bataille, mais tous les ans, nous continuons à nous retrouver. Je crois que c'est peut-être une boutade, mais c'est important à dire, parce que des, des millions et des centaines de millions et des milliards de personnes nous regardent, et ont l'espoir, et notamment en Afrique. Et la vulnérabilité de l'Afrique face au changement climatique est chaque jour beaucoup plus grande. Moi, je viens d'un pays de forêt, et même les pays de forêt sont aujourd'hui menacés. Nous voyons les agressions du temps tous les jours. Et pourtant, nous, les pays de forêt, nous faisons partie de la solution. Car il faut bien dire que les, 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 les défis qui sont les nôtres sont certes différents pour certains pays, mais c'est surtout de, pour nous de reconnaître que nous avons une responsabilité, car ce que nous allons faire de nos forêts peut avoir un impact beaucoup plus grand mais plus important pour les autres qui sont beaucoup plus démunis. Alors, je ne vais pas mobiliser la parole, surtout que mon ami Emmanuel Macron m'a déjà prévenu, il me dit si tu prends la parole, c'est que tu as quelque chose à dire et à annoncer. Alors, comme je disais que par rapport à la vulnérabilité de l'Afrique, je change face au changement climatique, nous avons au niveau du continent lancé il y a deux ans l'initiative africaine de l'adaptation qui nécessite pour son démarrage un budget estimé de à 5 millions de dollars d'ici à 2020. Et donc, l'heure étant donc à l'action, je voudrais faire d'abord une proposition. La proposition serait d'inviter le système financier et bancaire mondial à inventer des mécanismes originaux d'appui à l'adaptation et à l'atténuation. Et ce, en faisant en sorte, par exemple, que les prêts servant à la construction d'infrastructures relevant de l'atténuation, je dis par là, comme par exemple les barrages hydroélectriques, ou relevant de l'adaptation comme les digues, les canaux, eh bien, tout ceci, je voudrais que, que ces prêts soient affectés d'un label qu'on pourrait appeler label climat, et qui offrirait des taux et des conditionnalités préférentielles. Et donc c'est pour encourager. Deuxièmement, je voudrais dire que en tant que coordinateur du comité des chefs d'État africains sur le climat, je voudrais lancer une campagne de mobilisation de fonds pour l'initiative africaine sur l'adaptation auprès des États de l'Union africaine, et ce, pour montrer à la communauté internationale que le continent reste toujours engagé. Et il est bon que nous puissions aussi montrer l'exemple. Et à ce titre, comme j'ai indiqué que le, le budget nécessaire à la, au démarrage de ce fonds 
euh, est de 5 millions de dollars. Je voudrais dire que mon pays, le Gabon, va faire une contribution de 500 000 dollars à l'initiative africaine de l'adaptation. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Let me turn now to the Prime Minister of Denmark. Thank you so much for being here with us. You're a leading country as far as embracing renewable energy is concerned. Um, you are actually a key contributing country as well, so sort of shaming the rest of the international stage here. I was wondering, what role do you see for governments to finance more adaptation? Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank my good friend Emmanuel for hosting this meeting as well. I think it's very, very important. We met two years ago, um, and eight years, no, eight weeks before the Paris uh, Agreement, we met in New York and we signed up for the Sustainable Development Goals. I had the honor to chair that meeting. Uh, and now it's important that we deliver on, on, on both agendas, uh, so, so to speak. Um, and I think. The most important thing is to understand that this is not only something which comes with a price, uh, price tag. There's also huge business opportunities, actually. And I think my country is a living proof of that. Since I was born, um, we have doubled our GDP in, in Denmark without any increase in energy consumptions. And that's because we have been innovative. Uh, you can look at the Danish uh, wind industry, for instance. Uh, so it's doable to combine um, the idea of prosperity and uh, increasing living standards with protecting uh, the earth and, and, and uh, dealing with the climate uh, change. Um, I tried to convince uh, President Trump about this when I met him in the White House in March, uh, pointing out that uh, the wind belt in the US is actually comparable with the Rust Belt and there could be created thousands of thousands of jobs in that industry in in US. I wasn't very successful, uh, so now I will try again. And I think, what can we do? I mean, we can, of course, offer taxpayers money, and we do that in Denmark. We are among the few countries in the world uh, who uh, fulfill the UN uh, criteria when it comes to uh, aid assistance. But, I mean, that's not the only way forward. We need to combine taxpayers' money with private money. And what we can offer is to, um, to establish uh, partnerships. And I'm pleased to announce uh, two partnerships today. Um, first of all, we are going to launch at the 1st of January together with Chile and Ethiopia and Kenya and Korea and Vietnam and Mexico, uh, a new initiative called uh, Partnering for Green Growth and the Global Goals 2030, or in short, uh, P4G. Uh, and the backbone of our common efforts is the crucial engagement by cities and partnering organizations and businesses and civil society. Um, and the idea is to foster public-private partnerships in water, waste, energy, food and land use, cities and circular uh, economy. I'm very pleased that I just met with uh, Anne uh, Ildago, uh, the mayor of uh, Paris, who is uh, uh, currently uh, chairing the C40 network uh, of the 92 big cities around the globe, which I think cover something like 70% of the global emission, and they have decided to join this uh, initiative, uh, and I am very happy about that. We will host the first summit in Copenhagen next year in November, the 28th and 29th of November, and everybody uh, are welcome. Uh, and then, secondly, I have promised the Secretary General of UN uh, to, um, to, to take the lead uh, of Uh, initiative called the Clean Energy Investment uh, Coalition, where we will try to uh, mobilize governments and investors and international organizations to accelerate the energy transition, uh, and we will present our uh, results at the UN Secretary General's Climate Summit in, in 2019. So, I mean, just to summarize, of course, we need taxpayers' money, and I can only ask uh, everybody who do not fulfill the UN a goal yet to step up, um, but that is not enough. Uh, we need to combine taxpayers' money with, the, with private money, and we need to establish partnerships to truly prove 
that this is not only about a price tag, it's also about huge business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aha. Now let me turn to um, Chancellor Kern. Um, your excellent colleague here said, um, yes, taxpayers' money, but not just that. How do you corral finance? Your um, country is contributing to the Greek Climate Fund. Um, there are new commitments for Austria to finance new projects, but you can't do this on your own. And I had a very excellent question from the Egyptian Minister of Energy, who pointed out to me that 100 firms are responsible for, I'm sorry, I can't read your figures, but a lot of greenhouses. And surely, surely, we can make the private sector contribute to all these funds that Austria is contributing to as well. So how do we do that all together? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's sure that climate change is the most important challenge of our generation. And I'd like to stress that I like very much the ideas of Lars Löcken, which you have uh, presented here, because I, I strongly believe that this is a huge, huge business opportunity. If we see climate change not only as a threat, but as a chance, an opportunity for growth, for new jobs, for employment, uh, this gives us tremendous uh, um, boosts uh, for, our, for our intentions. And um, what we do in Austria is, of course, we have a certain commitment to be among the leading countries in uh, these common efforts. And Austria is among the countries with uh, the highest share of uh, renewable energy production. And in my country, we rely very much on, on hydropower, but we have also ambitious schemes for, for wind and solar power and biogas and so on. Um, so it's three aspects I'd like to stress. Uh, first uh, and foremost, um, Austria is firmly committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 36 percent by 2030 and to completely decarbonize our economy by 2050. To achieve this, we will need deep and rapid stru structural change. But I'm convinced that the necessary investments will boost. Second and equally important, uh, as you mentioned before, Austria stands by its commitment to contribute 500 million euro until 2020 to international climate finance. And in fact, Austria is currently on target to achieve even more than our initial goal. Uh, in the same way as we share the responsibility for fighting climate change, we also share the responsibility for financing the necessary measures that will drive the process of decarbonization. And of course, this has to be done also by taxpayers' money. And finally, I want to stress the importance of renewable energy and energy efficiency for achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. For the first time, energy from renewable sources such as solar and wind is economically competitive to fossil sources and much cheaper than nuclear energy. And I personally was deeply impressed that the president of uh, World Bank uh, at uh, our lunch today stressed that he has just recently visited a solar power plant which produces energy for 1.7 cents per kilowatt hour. If you compare that to the running costs of a nuclear power plant or a fossil power plant, uh, they are not competitive anymore. So this indicates in which uh, direction we have to go and I'm more than optimistic that um, we could achieve our goals. But let me stress Finally, again, the initial idea of, uh, of Lars Löcken, I think, I really think we have to transform our economies, we have to transform our societies, but to do so, we have to make a business model of, uh, out of fighting climate change. And this is a transition which will not only be driven by market forces, this is up to tough political decisions. Thanks a lot. Vielen Dank, mein Herr. Let me turn to the audience. And I'm turning to Suma Chakrabarti, whom I met this morning. Well, you, there you are. For a brief intervention regarding the role develop banks can, development banks can play to help finance more adaptation projects. I'm right behind you. You're right behind me. <laughs> Over here. There you are. Hi. I'm going to speak on behalf of the heads of the MDBs. Um, first of all, to say, from our point of view, this is a very much needed summit at the right time, for which we thank President Macron, UN Secretary General Gutierrez, and of course also our colleague, the President of the World Bank. Now, why are we together? We're together because we feel we've entered an era now of what we would call unprecedented change in our global climate system. If you look at CO2 concentration levels in our atmosphere, they're now higher than at any time in human history in fact, higher than any time in the last 800,000 years. 
Now, our warmer climate, planet quite clearly means a much more violent, much more unpredictable climate resulting in very much rising human, physical, and economic costs. And you saw that in the video at the beginning of this panel. And it's a cruel fact, colleagues, it's a cruel fact that people in poor developing countries are the most vulnerable to such impacts, being the least able to prepare for them uh, or to cope with them. And in, in addition to those human costs, something we don't talk about enough, I think, is also the threat to the global economy and to the financial system. I think, uh, quite honestly, the impacts of climate change may become a defining issue for stability as well. Now, we uh, in the multilateral development banks and our colleagues in the development finance institutions, we've been working on the climate adaptation challenge for now well over a decade. Uh, together, what we've been doing is we've been pioneering new tools for screening, for identifying climate risks, new instruments to, to strengthen the climate resilience of countries, communities, and businesses, private sector businesses. But most importantly, I think, through our investment operations, we've shared this experience by building capacity in our partner countries, both in the public but also in the private sectors. And the scale and urgency of the climate challenge means that further innovation and financing is absolutely paramount. And this is an area where the MDBs and multilateral banks can continue to contribute heavily. In fact, climate finance, uh, particularly for adaptation measures, is expanding in new and very innovative ways. The multilateral banks, the countries we serve, the companies we work with, they're increasingly linking concessional sources of finance with local financial intermediaries to deliver climate resilience. Or we're using insurance-based uh, mechanisms such as risk pooling facilities that provide that financial protection in the wake of extreme weather events. There are many, many examples such as these from the multilateral development banks and the development financing institutions across the world. And also, the multilaterals have been recently engaged in collaborative work on climate resilience metrics to more consistently track and report on the climate resilience benefits of our investments. Now, in 2012, the multilateral banks introduced what we call a joint and systematic adaptation finance reporting. This is important. It's important to measure what we're doing. This measure has now enabled the multilateral banks to track in a much more meaningful way the ambitious commitments that we've all made uh, towards increasing the provision of adaptation finance as part of our overall climate finance target for 2020, just three years away. As of 2016, the good news is that cumulative multilateral bank adaptation financing has now reached $31 billion, with $6.2 billion provided in 2016 alone. And all of us, you can see, all of us are working very, very hard to scale up climate adaptation financing. Now, where the MDBs have led, and this goes back to my eco economic point, commercial financial institutions are also now following. So we have the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, quite a mouthful. It's been led by Mark McCartney and Mike Bloomberg, and it's emphasized the urgent need for innovation and action on climate risk management by the wider financial sector. And working together, I think, the multilateral banks can help mainstream climate resilience across the financial sector. So ladies and gentlemen, to, to conclude with my statement, I think we in the banks, we in the multilateral development banks, we're very well aware of the need to consider a better balance between adaptation and mitigation financing. As the climate changes, that need for finance that builds resilience of uh, countries, of communities, of businesses, is going to rise, but we must also continue to pursue mitigation, because if you do insufficient mitigation, that's going to result in unsustainable adaptation costs. And through our work together, the multilateral banks are acutely aware, acutely aware of the breadth and depth of the adaptation challenge. We see this through our daily work, the range and scale of climate change impacts, and that's the reason for stepping up, for stepping up our resilience building activities and financing across the globe. Because, quite frankly, to borrow a phrase, we only have one planet and we need to maintain our ability and those of our children and grandchildren to live in it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Shukabati. Earlier this morning, I met with someone who's actually sort of fantastic. Her name is Celestine Ketcha. She's the mayor of a uh, town in Bang Bagongte. And she said, we're missing women here. I mean, they're at the heart of climate f uh, change fight. 
Who do you give? Who's handling the utilities? Who's handling the bills? That's what she said. Women handle the bills. They are the ones who are paying electricity. They are the ones who have to pay kerosene, if need be, for the needs of the family. I would like to um, turn to Miss Sarah Toomey. Um, rarely uh, a woman, forgive me, Madam Prime Minister. Uh, she, uh, she wants to speak about the role of women in agriculture, uh, which is key for food security, stability of her country, uh, of the continent of Africa. Miss Toomey. Bonjour à tous, mesdames et messieurs. Je profite d'être devant vous aujourd'hui afin de rendre hommage à une majorité invisible dont on parle beaucoup, mais qui n'a pas souvent l'occasion de parler pour elle-même. Cette majorité, c'est la jeunesse, la jeunesse qui innove, la jeunesse qui innove alimentée par l'énergie renouvelable de l'espoir. Malheureusement, cette jeunesse subit de plein fouet les impacts négatifs du changement climatique et de l'inaction standardisée qui la pousse à braver les déserts et les mers à la recherche d'un avenir meilleur ailleurs. J'ai l'honneur d'être ici sur l'invitation d'un homme, Monsieur le Président de la République française, Emmanuel Macron, qui a compris que la jeunesse est une force et m'a nommé au sein du Conseil présidentiel pour l'Afrique, avec neuf autres personnalités de la société civile, pour porter humblement la voix de cette jeunesse qui fait. Depuis cinq ans, j'agis aux côtés des agricultrices de Tunisie, un pays où 75% des terres sont en cours de désertification alors que le chômage bat son plein dans les zones rurales. C'est le moment d'investir dans les femmes et surtout les agricultrices. Il ne s'agit plus d'une option. Les former, les former à la restauration des sols à travers l'agroécologie et les soutenir en, en leur offrant des investissements et des financements adaptés afin qu'elles puissent valoriser leurs terres. Voilà une solution concrète pour l'adaptation au changement climatique, la lutte contre la désertification, la sécurité alimentaire, la paix et le développement de chaînes de valeur durables. Et c'est ce que nous nous évertuons à faire chez Acacias for All, mon entreprise sociale, avec l'objectif de planter un million d'arbres d'ici la fin 2018. Ces arbres qui plus tard donneront des olives, des dates, du moringa et surtout créeront des milliers d'emplois, restaurant les sols, mais aussi l'air, l'air d'un monde où le travail en commun est respecté. Je ne suis pas, pour rebondir sur le prochain intervenant, je ne suis pas Sarah Connor, je suis juste Sarah Toumi, une jeune femme qui croit au pouvoir des alliances concrètes et transparentes entre la société civile et les autres acteurs, pour qu'ensemble nous sauvions notre planète de la destruction. So please stop talking, let's acting now. Thank you. And indeed, she's not Sarah Connor, she's Sarah Toomey. It's a name to remember. But let me turn, actually, I'm pretty sure you've known, uh, you've uh, found out who's our next guest. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger himself, people. Mr. Schwarzenegger, thank you so much for being with us. It's an honor to have you here. <laughs> Governor of California before Mr. Brown, founder of the R20 network of regions which are committed to the climate agenda. So, Mr. Schwarzenegger, in the current context, what can your network do? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you very much for having me here. I want to say thank you to uh, President Macron for uh, doing such an extraordinary job and being such a fantastic leader. We are very proud of you. Let's give him a big, big hand for the <laughs> wonderful leadership. I think it is very important that we don't concentrate so much just on a top-down approach on this whole issue. I have seen firsthand when I was governor of the state of California of how powerful states and cities are. Subnational governments create 70% of the solution, 70% of the action. So we should never forget that. It was the state of California that made the first commitment of reducing greenhouse gases by 25% by the year 2020. 
and 85% by the year 2050. We started the Million Solar Roof Initiative, and we are now already meeting our goal for 2020 in renewables, which is 50%. And we will hit by 2020 our 2030 goal by 65% of renewables. The reason why I'm mentioning that to you is, is why it is so important to think more about the power of the states and the cities is because there were some people worried that President Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement. Well, you shouldn't worry about that because, as I said, the states and cities have a lot of power. So Donald Trump did not pull the United States out of the Paris Agreement. Donald Trump pulled Donald Trump out of the Paris Agreement. And the only problem he has is that he's stuck in the past while we are all marching into the future. And I can tell you one thing that I'm very proud of the kind of work that is going on here. And I just want to just emphasize one other issue that is extremely important. And that is, I've heard a lot of speeches here today, but there was no one yet talking about the amount of people that are dying because of pollution. Do you know that the latest study shows that the World Health Organization has told us that 9 million people died last year because of pollution? 9 million people, this is much more than with all the wars, all the traffic accidents, all the suicides, homicides, and all of the stuff together. 9 million. And no one talks about it? Are you kidding me? I think we should talk about it because while this conference is going on, there's another four thousand people dying. Every day, 19,000 people are dying. So I think that we should really start talking about that because this is a key issue when you talk about the communication. When we talk about global climate change, it's not just global climate change and be worried about what's happening in the future, but we are worried about what is happening today. The day people are dying, the day people are having cancer, the day people are having heart attacks, the day people have respiratory problems, the day that is the problem, not the moral, the day. So let's talk about that and communicate to the people in the world the right way to talk about pollution and to talk about global climate change and to talk about the job creation, to talk about national security, to talk about all of those issues rather than just climate change. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I think that sort of uh, concludes our uh, fantastic second segment. I have to thank all of you. Once more, Secretary General, uh, uh, Councillor, Prime Minister, Monsieur le Président, merci beaucoup. Et merci à vous, Monsieur Schwarzenegger. Thank you, Geraldine, and thank you, Governor Schwarzenegger, for this wake-up call. Very energizing. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're going to talk about how to uh, accelerate the transformation towards a low-carbon economy. Adaptation is important. It's also important to mitigate uh, the effect of climate change. Let's uh, watch uh, a short video that will show us uh, well, how some people are thinking about the price of carbon in the world. That's, of, of course, a, a crucial aspect uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. Let's take a look. This story isn't about taking sides. It's about our economy and our future. The fact is, air pollution isn't free. Left unchecked, it will cause unprecedented global damage. But in many countries, carbon emitters pump greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere at no cost. The bill for the damage comes to all of us in the form of threats to public health, food and water shortages, storm damage, and overall uncertainty in the marketplace. This is unsustainable. But addressing this issue creates opportunity when polluting has a price, efficiency and innovation are rewarded. Whether we tax it, set up emissions trading systems, or regulate it, carbon pricing is good for business and good for people. We save money by maximizing energy efficiency. We spur innovation in renewable energy, manufacturing, and transportation. We build smart, livable cities, and we create jobs. Businesses, cities, states, and countries are already putting these solutions to work. 
By implementing a carbon tax, British Columbia reduced emissions and cut taxes for its citizens. Morocco set a renewable energy target and reduced its energy subsidies. As a result, its renewable energy investment grew sixfold, enabling Morocco to become an innovation hub for solar power. California expects to collect billions from emissions permit fees, which will then be invested in clean energy and low carbon development. And China is testing seven emissions trading systems locally with the intention to expand nationally. Since 2005, carbon markets have expanded across the world. Momentum for meaningful carbon pricing is growing. Now we need businesses and governments to lead together for our health, our economy, and our future. Join us. So we're now going to talk about carbon neutrality as our ambition, thinking long term. And I will call our panelists to join us and to join me here on stage, Mr. Jim Yonkin, president of the World Bank. Could you please join us, sir? Thank you. President uh, Henrique Peña Nieto, president of the Republic of Mexico. Please take a seat. The vice, uh, vice premier of the People's Republic of China, Ma Kai. The Prime Minister of Netherlands, Mr. Mark Rutte.